Um, it being 10 o'clock, uh, I'm going to open the uh, Division Three uh, work session to discuss House Bill 49. Uh, this is a, uh, basically a continuation of a conversation we began last Friday. Um, we, we got a lot of progress done, I think, but, but we, we didn't complete the conversation. So, um, so this is an attempt to sort of go back to HB 49, go back to the amendment that was offered by, um, by Representative Wallner. Uh, and, uh, and before we broke huddle, I pointed out that I had two amendments, and I, I named them, that I'd like to be able to uh, discuss today. So um, there, this is a very hot topic. Um, the Sununu Center is scheduled to close on 1 March, and I think today is the 8th. So, so you, can, you can hear the clock ticking, I think. Um, if we don't do exactly what the Senate did with SB1 when the full finance committee gets it tomorrow, uh, then we open up some questions about whether or not uh, whatever we do that's different can get turned around through the House and back over the Senate in time for them to do their thing to, um, to get it to the governor before March 1st. So, so there's, just, there's just authentic time pressure here. Now, now there is some good news uh, on that front, so it's not it's not complete panic. We we uh, the speaker we the speaker uh, have been talking to um, uh, Senator Bradley and Senator Carson uh, about SB one. Um, they are aware that we may not be in a position. We maybe we are, but we may not be in a position to send them. SB1 approved by the House, um, and and so um, Senator Bradley, when, when I spoke to him this morning, is anticipating kind of I wouldn't call it the worst case scenario, but it would it would be it would be uh, not the best case scenario for the Senate. They would have to receive something from us, uh, and that they would have to uh, dispose of it uh, rapidly. Uh, and favorably in order to get it to the governor on time to forestall the one March closure date. It's, there seems to be a path to success though. That's the good news. And I think as long as we do the best we can to re respect the fact that they voted 24 to nothing for SB1, that's pretty, that's a pretty strong vote. If we can respect some of what that work accomplishment was, um, I, 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 I think the state can be in a really good place for taking care of um, this, this uh, situation. So, um, so that's kind of my introduction to, to where we're at. Uh, I understand that uh, Representative Nordgren is uh, not gonna be able to be in the room with us, but that she's watching uh, live um, could could somebody confirm? Or I could, I I would like to to, to to one of our conversations, Representative Walner. I I want to make sure that when we go around and we talk about things, even though that she's not here, if she were to be talking to somebody, I I just don't want to leave her behind. Uh, do you know? Does anyone have comms with her? I, I'm not going to ask you to do that because that would probably create all kinds of precedent and violation issues with the House rules, and I don't want to do that. But if 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 the Democrat caucus was comfortable that we were not leaving anyone behind as we went forward, that would be that would be good. Okay, super. Um, okay, so. So to take this to the next step, I think I said, you know, we're, we are working on House Bill 49. The amendment that uh, Representative Walner gave to us last week is, a, is a, a, an amendment to House Bill 49. What um, we 
we'll be looking at SB1 in full finance tomorrow, and it's going to be coming to us as a, a Division Three work session later tomorrow. So what we say on today on House Bill 49 and the amendment, I view it as the dress rehearsal for what we're going to end up doing with SB1, because it's clear from communications with the Senate that the vehicle they want us to send them back is SB1, it's easier for them to deal with. So, 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 you know, I'm sorry for the confusion. We are talking about HB 49 formally and officially, but, but this is really to help us get rapidly to a resolution tomorrow when SB1 becomes a work session product for division three. Um, now, just, just to clean up one stray thought is that on the assumption that some of the excellent work that's in SB1 uh, gets onto the cutting room floor, to use the film analogy, all, all of those issues can be uh, considered and potentially incorporated into House Bill 2 uh, with a House Bill 1 a dollar amount allocated to, to support what we put into House Bill 2. So, so, so even, even those things that we don't keep in SB1 are not dead. They're not dead letters because we're going to, we're, we're obviously days away from having the governor's budget. And so we'll continue to talk about, about it. So those, those issues are not dead. The, 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 um, I think the issue is that we're, we're, we're trying to use the metaphor, less is more. We, we want to we keep something kind of tight uh, that uh, really represents uh, what's critical, given the one March deadline. And I would ask us to apply our judgment so that we maybe include enough stuff to sweeten the pot for the Senate to increase the propensity of them concurring with our changes. It's totally a subjective thing that's independent thinking on all of your parts. So, um, so with, with that, I, I, can, I can go back to 0311, which is the Walner Amendment that we talked about last Friday. I'll pause here. Yes, ma'am. I just have a little technical question. I'm trying to pull up SB1 um, so I can just have it on my laptop, <clears throat> and perhaps Mr. Ripple can help me. The um, I have, I'm in the docket. It says, as amended by the Senate and as amended by the Senate second version. I don't see anything as passed by the Senate. Can you just verify which one I should be looking at? Second. Thank you. I apologize for the interruption. That's a good question, uh, and and it's the second version that got uh, passed twenty four to nothing, and uh, and and we'll end up talking about a couple of key things that was done uh, in that in order to get the unanimity of uh, support for it. So, um, so so Representative Walner, because we're going to uh, open today's in depth discussions with your amendment, do. You, I, I, I know that you're busy, uh, but but I want to I want to respect your ability to say what you want about where we are with with your amendment. Well, I did. You got a button. When we left here, I thought I did not redraft this amendment. I saw this as sort of a working amendment uh, because as we talked about it, there were other things that came up particularly uh, uh, Mr. Ripson talked about needing some funds to get to the end of June, some additional funds. So that wasn't in the original amendment. So the amendment is pretty straightforward. It um, would move the closing date to June 20, June 30th, 2025. Oh, sorry. It would move it to June 30, 2025. And I just sort of grabbed that as a time. I didn't know how long it would really actually take to finish the construction. Um, and it appropriated 
$2 million for site evaluation, architectural cons consultation, and development of a design. And uh, then not included in that, but we talked about it was needing um, $1.5 uh, million for operating funds um, to get them through to June 30th. So, okay, so everything you said I, is accurate in my view. And, and just to uh, kind of make the point, uh, this is going to be a working conversation with the idea that when we're done, uh, we'll have given Mr. Ripple more than enough notes to go work with OLS to come up with a, a draft, or excuse me, a, um, an amendment for us. And that when we come back in our working session tomorrow, with with hope and luck and all good speed, we should have an actual uh, amendment to uh, HB 49. I'm going to ask him to go ahead and have an identical copy readied for SB 1 so that when we get into our work session, we'll have talked about all of this stuff. Today, there'll be no surprises, but if we like what we've done, we're in a position to immediately act on SB1 as it's been assigned to us by the, by the, uh, by the chair, uh, Representative Weiler. Is that confusing or is that clear? If, if, the, if the Division Three members understand what we're doing, then I applaud you. <laughs> but, okay. All right. So... Um, to, to line seven, um, Mr. Ripple and, and everyone on, uh, 0311, the Walner Amendment, I'll just call it the Walner Amendment from now on. Um, this is, uh, down to line 12, an appropriation of $2 million for them to go do site evaluation, architectural consulting, and design uh, development design options for the replacement center. One of the things we talked about last week that I think this paragraph needs to have included in it is some language to direct DAS to give us two distinct options. And, and the, and the, and right now it's just implying that there's going to be one option for the most part, but we need two distinct options. One option would be uh, the, a 6 to 12 range, and the other would be a 12 to 18 range. And uh, in, in brainstorming this yesterday with Representative Hole, there was a possibility he might try to his shot at writing some language in that regard did, did you do that representative thank you i did not i spoke with mr ripple and asked that we work out something for language but to take each whatever amendment 0311 which is just referred to as the walner amendment and add in the necessary costs to continue operation of the sununu center um through the balance of this budget cycle knowing that HB2 and HB1... So, so one well, step at a time. I know. Right now, we're just talking about the design money, and we'll right. get, we'll get okay. to the operations money. We'll, okay. we'll, we'll do that. So, so I have asked that Mr. Ripple craft something, and we'll figure out how to make that such that after the design phase or the conceptual design phase, but before the detailed design phase, that there is some review back with either fiscal or House and Senate finance combined. Oh, Not oh, sure how to make that process work yet. So, so, so based on that feedback, Mr. Ripple, do, do you think that you have an, enough information to create an enlightened addition to this paragraph so that we're getting the two? I think so. I think I would just need to know exactly which committees you want the two designs to go to and whether you want those committees to review the designs or approve one of the two designs. That's a really good question, and I, I, I have my answer to that. Um, I, I, I'm going to ask Representative Weiler if, um, if, 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 he'll, if he'll listen in on this and give it his input. I, I, I think that we wanted to um, at least go back to the Joint Legislative Fiscal Committee 
I would think that we would want the Joint Legislative Fiscal Committee to exercise um, the authority to approve or disapprove of the design because there may be the release of additional money to begin the build part of the construction. I would want, as a courtesy, to give HHS oversight a copy of the committee of, of that report. I would also think children and family law should, I, I, I just don't know how detailed to get into this, whether we should just be giving it to the speaker and to the Senate and the governor and just, and not worry about distribution beyond the joint legislative fiscal committee. I I'll take guidance. My view is <clears throat> we're two years behind because of what happened in the last budget and we didn't go ahead and do anything and what we're seeing from the director is a continuing decrease in population and we heard from uh, representative kirk who's also given this quite a bit of attention that yes likelihood is that it will be a smaller building than what some of these things and the most important thing is that we change the March 1st deadline. That's all that's important. All the rest of this, I think we're moving too fast, and I'm not ready to, to start designing a new building until we get some idea. We're already, as I said, we're two years behind, so we're, we're way behind on where we should be, and, and I think you're trying to make it move a little faster, but I'm not sure we're ready for that. Uh, that's my opinion, that we should try to see if, if the... If the forecast is that the population will continue to shrink, we may need to look at it for a couple of years and see, is that, is that the instance? Or do we need more? So I'm not so sure we know what to do with that. Representative Stringham, you have a question? Um, well, I'm kind of the new guy uh, here and in, in, in this process and didn't uh, struggle through the, the last budgetary cycle. Uh, been kind of listening uh, to some of the preliminary uh, uh, information meetings we've had. And, um, uh, you know, my, my initial reaction uh, was, um, you, know, f uh, you know, first of all, New Hampshire relies heavily on contractors. We talked about our four, 400 contractors, um, and we have extensive processes uh, to assure quality and efficiency using that kind of a mechanism, unlike uh, most states in the area. And, um, you know, applying my kind of my general uh, um, business background and listen, listening uh, to what I hear, heard here, um, you know, we had, you know, somewhat relieved we only had 15% job attrition in the last last few months. We have 60% uh, vacancies uh, in jobs, I guess 28 out of 45 positions. And uh, uh, trying to make a major, major decision about, um, you know, what kind of a replacement center uh there could be uh i know in in you know when when uh a brand name or or certain type of service gets a bad reputation it can be really really difficult uh to turn it around um and you know it could take 20 years and one slip up and we're back where we are again uh, because of what's happened in this case uh here so um uh and you know, I, I was quite taken by uh, Representative Kirk's comments, and as uh, Chairman uh, Weiler just mentioned, that um, uh, uh, you know I'm in line to take a deep breath. But even I even think we should go back and consider um, the idea of uh, you know the make make versus build model of whether um, we could do a better job for these kids and for our taxpayers. Uh, perhaps contracting out these services rather than even building a new facility, let alone designing it and coming up with the ideal size. Um, again, you know, this this is just uh, mine coming in. Uh, you know, as a totally totally new perspective on this, only only really following this in the last couple of weeks. So, uh, thank you for that. I I, I think you opened up a, a a second issue beyond what I was trying to get us to focus on, which is just simply, um, if we go and ask for design recommendations, who should review them and approve them? And, 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 I, and I still think I, I agree with what is in the Walner 
um, the assumption that's built into the Walner Amendment that we should go ahead and, and appropriate some money now for these designs to begin because as what was mentioned we, we've already kind of wasted two years and to pick up on the vacancy issue we're already having trouble recruiting and retaining uh and and i think we're just in a situation where i'm starting to fear uh an, an employee collapse of the system if we if we can't if we can't start doing something on offense and if we continue to look as though the legislature is never going to get around to solving this decades old problem i'm just concerned that we're going to break the break what we got completely and and what we'd really like to do is we'd like to have them start implementing this therapeutic model we we had testimony last week that as much as the department would like to implement the therapeutic model that children and family law has said repeatedly over the terms is essential to the future of how we take care of these kids that we we just can't do it unless we stabilize our employment situation and we give the department the 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 room to breathe to hire and start training and retraining the their people to begin the new approaches and so so my fear if we if we don't signal that we're going to move forward it just it's just going to keep hurting these kids i think we're hurting kids at this point uh, Re Re representative walner what do you what, what what do you think this is your amendment and you've got the appropriation of two million in there what do you think Well, I think that we're getting close to when we're going to see the budget. Next week, we're going to have the budget, and we're going to start the budget process. Really, historically, I think that the way this would be dealt with, it does have, I mean, the Senate Bill 1, not not 49, but Senate Bill 1 um, does have a fairly large appropriation in it. Um, it's not unusual for the Finance Committee to... Um, hold money bills and as and you do them as we're doing the budget and to me at, at this point i have to say i agree with uh representative weiler that maybe we hold on here put the date out and um make sure that people understand that it's not not going to close immediately i mean it's not going to close on march 1st and we um take a look a real hard look at this during the budget process and see how much needs to be appropriated. So this was my amendment from last week was strictly a draft of a work, you know, some working ideas. I, I think it was brilliant though. And I preferred it to where we are right now. So uh, representative Hull, did you, do you have comments or thoughts on this? I do. Um, thank you. Pushing out the deadline by, although it's to whatever, two years plus from now, right? Pushes it into the next, into this budget cycle at a minimum. Effectively, the House will have a budget in less than seven weeks, or our side of it. So if we've moved it out and funded operations through the balance of this biennium, um, the, the potential loss of personnel is addressed. We know we have to fund this anyway in a budget. We're going to be doing that working concurrently on that. So a simple amendment that just funds operations through the end of the year um, at the 1.5 or 1.6 requested by the department um, gets us there. And that may not be what the Senate is interested in, but at least it eliminates the issue at hand, which is closure, whatever, three and a half weeks from now. Um, and I think that's what everybody is is thinking about and gives us time to do due diligence on this because it is a different legislature. There are some different views on how many people should be, the facility should be planned for and what is the appropriate um, policies regarding incarceration versus training versus whatever. So so I'm, I'm, I'm trying to 
chunk this out and I, I'm still just dealing with the chunk on line 7 through 12 on the appropriation of the two million dollars what I'm hearing is a sense of the committee that we don't really want to do that we want to go ahead and pull that appropriation out and 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 not direct the site evaluation and design to begin after all because we think we can do this in HB2 when we've not been able to do it in the last five attempts. But somehow in the calm, non-pressure of the HB2 process, we're going to finally achieve resolution of something that's been lost to us for a decade. That, that, that's what I hear the sense to be. Um, and I, I will defer the cumulative guy, uh, experience here certainly outweighs mine. It, it doesn't, that does not feel like a good plan to me. I, I would like to advocate for us to keep this appropriation in there for, uh, to go ahead and initiate the design. Um, uh, under two models, kind of a small model, a middle model, and uh, so, that, so that when we come back in January, we actually have some information that we keep saying we don't have. So I, 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 that, that's what I'd like to do. So, so, so I think I, I, we agree that, that the first part of the Wolner Amendment to kick this out all the way through the next fiscal year, the closing of the next fiscal year, is the right thing to do. We all agree on that. Is there anyone who disagrees with kicking it out to the end of the next fiscal year? No, what I wanted to talk about, and I, the, the name of it escapes me now, Keith and I were discussing it, a program starting with the younger kids that perhaps prevents them from getting into trouble when they get to be 14, 15, 16. We start with the 11, 12, 13-year-old, maybe... What's the name System of it? System of Care. System of Care. How long has it been going on? Uh, c come on up, uh, and if you can also be prepared to tell us the numbers that you do have, because um, I think that was one of your homework assignments. I mean, to... it's almost too soon to see the results of that program, but if that program has the capacity to reduce this population, then we have to deal with that. Good morning, everybody. Joe Ripsom, Director of DCYF. Good to see everyone. Um, so where would you like me to start with the uh, budget I, numbers or with let, let's address numbers? representative Weiler's issue uh, about the system of care uh, giving the system of care, to restate it I think the the question is um, do we do we believe that if we can as we continue to mature and develop the system of care model that that system of care model with the earlier community-based interventions do we believe that will have a positive impact on reducing the potential detainee and committed populations in Sununu? The, the demographic, demographics we've seen for three years is pretty steady, at ranging from 12 to 18. Just, just system of care. Do we have hope that the system of care changes will, will drop that number further? Yep. So the data that I passed around, I know the first sheet looks familiar. There's two sheets in this that are not familiar to you that start to tell this story. Mm -hmm. So, and starts to answer the question of that, yes, the system of care is one already having an impact. And yes, I do think it's going to have a longer term impact. All that being said, we are already, I'll repeat, already the lowest combined rate of detention and commitment in the country. There is no precedent anywhere else in the nation for having a lower level than we currently have, right? So the idea that three years of steady data is going to change in the next two years, I'm a little skeptical about, right? I think we actually have a pretty good data set to make decisions on. That being said, I do hope that what we're seeing right now is the system of care having its impact on the older youth to the extent that it can. When the system of care really starts churning, that's when it starts getting those 10 and 11 year olds today that don't turn into the 16 and seven year olds, 16, 17 year olds that show up in these facilities. You're talking another seven, 10 years down the road, you might see the need drop by 
another number of kids, but I don't think you're going to eliminate the need for a secured facility. So let me walk folks through this data just to kind of explain what we're seeing in the system. I, I'm going to ask a clarification and, right. uh, and, and, a, and a, a, da a data check. La yeah. Last week, you, you, I think you showed up saying that we were second best in the nation. Today, you're, you're saying we're best, the best. Second best detention. We are behind Maine, who claims to have zero detained kids, which I'm skeptical about. They do have a program that they call shock incarceration, which I think is just another word for detention, but it makes them categorize it as commitment, which would make us number one in detention. We are second best in commitment behind Connecticut. When you add up Connecticut's two numbers and Maine's two numbers, we are lowest overall. So the lowest combined rate of detention and commitment is what I would say. But if you're measuring them as individual, we're second to Maine in detention. Uh, okay, so that's really good. Yes. Uh, and then uh, to the other point, I, I think you uh, qualitatively suggested that we could um, have a, a, an improvement still if system of care matures, but but I kind of need a number. If we're if we're if we've been ranging between twelve to eighteen, what's your professional judgment telling us? Yeah. Are we ten to twelve? Are we where, where where do you think this is going? Because <clears throat> Because we're being asked to look into the future in a crystal ball. What's your crystal ball telling you? It's really, really hard for me to tell you that, right? And then there's other variables that we don't have right now that we don't know, right? You could have major changes in our demographics that, that change, you know, what, what we see in terms of crime and criminal behavior. You could have rapid, you know, increases in, in different type of criminal and gang activities that we don't currently see much of right now in New Hampshire, right? So there's other dynamics beyond just this that could happen into the future that could change some of this. That being said, right, right now, we've been averaging 12, we crest at 18, we bottom out at five at times. And, you know, but through all of that, the idea is that you still, when an average of 12, you need flexibility within your building. We don't want any more kids there than we need. And I think our history shows that we don't have a history of overutilizing the facility, right? I have 144 beds today. And if there's only five kids that need to be there, then only five kids are in that building, right? We're not trying to fill this building up, but the 18 beds would give flexibility to make sure that you're able to, even if we are at a point where we only needed eight, that you're able to separate kids based on gender, based on pr criminal activity, based on um, gang affiliations based on behavioral um, challenges between them. So I, I guess, you know, my, my belief is that the 18 beds really is not an excessive number and isn't a reason for us to not move forward with this because at the end of the day, all you're really getting is some extra flexibility to allow us to have appropriate separation of kids at times based on their needs. But with that, I'm happy to go into the data. Oh, oh, go ahead and hit this data. Sure. So... <clears throat> We talked about this last time, right? You do see around 2018, two things happened at once, right? The system of care, SB 14 at the time passes, big investment happens at that time with the system of care coming up. At the same time, changes in our laws around detention and commitment and who could be detained and committed happens. So you see this big collapse of who's going into SYSC. Now, if what all that happened in the system, right? Because I think we heard testimony last week that that change in law was the only thing that made a difference, right? I, I think last week, former Chair Kirk suggested that that's the big thing that's happened and that we could change all of this just by changing the law again. And I want to make sure that people are clear that that's not the only thing that's happening here. If that's what, if that was the only thing that happened, you would expect that these kids that used to be at SYSC would show up in non-secured programs, right? They'd show up in residential programs. So the next page. If you look at the next page around 2018, you see, you know, we used to hover around 200 justice involved kids in residential care. And you do see it, it makes a jump when that law change happens when SYSE stops taking so many kids. And then you see it start to go down, right? You see a big jump here around 2020 with COVID, and I'll talk about that in a minute. But you see this downward trend happening long before COVID. This is the system of care starting to work with kids and starting to get kids community-based care. So it's already having an impact, not just at SYSC, but also in the residential system and actually really serving kids in the community where they need to be, which is an amazing thing that we should all be really, really proud of. Um, 
What you see down here, I like to be a little bit careful to not claim that this 100-ish level in residential, which is the current level of kids and juvenile justice in residential care, that is somewhat suppressed artificially by workforce issues at residential programs, right? So I don't wanna claim that this is the, the new status quo because the real demand is probably slightly higher than where this is, but the new status quo is probably somewhere lower than here because what's been happening at the same time is what you see on the next page. The next page is the data with the flagship program of the Children's System of Care. So the flagship program of the System of Care is something that we call Fast Forward. It's a high fidelity wraparound program for young people to work, um, for young people and their families to work with the team. The team's led by a clinical person. They bring together everybody who's important to that kid and family, clinicians who are working with them, the schools, um, other family members, grandparents, aunt, uncles, members of the faith community, whoever it is that's important to that kid and family. And they also put in home clinicians in the home to start working with the kids. They connect the adults with peer support through NAMI New Hampshire, and they connect the kids with peer support as well so that the kids have somebody to talk to about the challenges they're facing with, you know, having mental health challenges. You'll see here they're serving close to 500 kids, right? I'm not claiming that every kid at SYSC is showing up here instead. That's not what this is. This system serves kids with behavioral health care needs across the spectrum, including the juvenile justice population, but not exclusive to the juvenile justice population, right? So that's why these numbers aren't going to be a one-for-one -one shift. That's not what's happening here. But they are absorbing tons of these kids that used to be in residential care and used to be at SYSC. So all that's to say to answer... Um, uh, Chair Weiler's question that, yes, the system of care is having an impact today. It's critical that we continue to support and invest that into the future because it's going to keep having an impact. My experience running a comparable system in New Jersey tells me that it will continue to have an impact over time. But I am really, really cautious that when we're already the lowest detention and commitment in the country, that we can start to bank further reductions. And that what you're really talking about is the difference between building a few bedrooms on a facility that otherwise is going to be comparable, right? So the savings of building a few bedrooms is not all that significant. And then that leads into the conversation about the costs that we can get into in a minute. But as I said last time, the real savings, if we're talking from strictly an economic perspective, from my view, is the savings of moving to a shared services model. Like that's where we're going to actually reduce the cost of SYSC that's been operating on an island for 140 years, right? And now when it's operating on an island serving 12 kids where you have to run 24 seven nursing in a separate commercial kitchen and all this other stuff, it makes no sense, right? You put that same program next to a Hampstead or next to a New Hampshire hospital where you can share those services and your operational costs are gonna go down by a couple million plus a year, and that's gonna be the savings, right? Worrying about the couple million you're gonna spend on five extra bedrooms doesn't seem to be the, uh, the the biggest worry when every single year there's a general fund savings of two to three million out there that we're gonna waste because we're worried about saving two millions in ARPA to, to prevent us from building five bedrooms. So I'm gonna put some words in your mouth. And, 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 and if they're not comfortable there, just, you know, cha change them. What, 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 I, what I think I heard you say <clears throat> is that, yes, system of care has been delivering. It's likely to continue to deliver, but that we're never going to get to the point where we're at zero. There's always going to be some kids that need this level of physical security. Um, we've committed to closing the existing facility, which means we need to have some kind of a replacement facility. That that that's where we're at. We we you 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 aren't prepared to tell us what that number of the capacity of that replacement facility is. But it sounds like you're kind of comfortable with a maximum of 18. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. You know, when we look at the data for the past three years, 18 has been kind of the high water mark, and that's been rare but we do need flexibility for operational reasons, right? So that's <clears throat> that's where we get to the 18 number. It's not that we anticipate 18 kids being there regularly. It's that we need to have mostly flexibility for kids. And on the rare occasion that we hit that high water mark, we, we need to have the op the ability to, to meet the demand. So, so if we do not put the appropriation 
to have the department go out to start doing some design planning and site evaluation. If we don't put it into this budget bill, put it into the budget, that's probably at least a four month delay in having you start that work. Correct. Is there any value in delaying having that design work done? There's, it's going to have to get done, is it not? I don't think there's any value in delaying any of this, is my opinion, right? We're, we're at a point that if we want to be able to use the federal ARP dollars, we're really at the end of the time frame to hit go. Um, we wasted a year not doing anything because we couldn't come to agreement last session. And that was already going to be ambitious. At this point, we're really at the end. So if we want to use those resources instead of general fund resources for this purpose, we really need to hit go as soon as possible. If, on the other hand, we don't care about that, then I guess we can wait. So, so, so I made a statement before you took you came up. It said, I fear that a lack of action can lead to an employment collapse at the Sununu Center. Is that just hand-wringing and fear-mongering on my part? What, to what extent is that a rational concern? I think it's already, we've already experienced that. And the people that are left, you know, I've begged and pleaded and cajoled to stick around, promising that there's relief on the way, that there's a future, you know, and, and the process and pointing to these, every newspaper article talking about, you know, when, when former Chair Umberger said, we're not going to let this place close in a few months, I walked into the facility and I showed them that newspaper article, say, look, like you're going to have a job, you know, and when the Senate passed that bill unanimously, I walked in there and I showed them that. You know, and that gets people to say, okay, and we've actually been able to start having some productive interviews with people who, you know, typically interview in this area, am I going to have a job if I take this? And, you know, when we can point to those newspaper articles, that gives us some, some ability to convince people that they have a future if they take a job with us. But no, if we don't have a plan, if we're in limbo. So, so, so just to make it explicit, tell, tell us what the so what factor is. So, so what, if we... If we approve this appropriation for design and site evaluation now and instead of four months, so what? What what difference will that make to you and your ability to run this mission? Well, I think certainly if if this is going to be a two-step process, if you're not going to just go forward with SB1 or something comparable in the short term, then we lose the ability to use ARP funds for construction. That'll be off the table. Uh, rep were you, you've been waiting, haven't you? Uh, then we'll come to you, Representative Irv. Go ahead, Representative Weiler. Um, <laughs> I just wondered what the, um, how, how much time do we have with the ARPA funds? I know there's a time they have to be committed and then you have to spend them down. What, what is yeah. that looking like? Yeah, I'm not, I'm not the expert on that. Um, the governor's budget director came to the Senate, um, finance committee and testified that it was something around the September 2025 mark or, or shortly thereafter, but it was, it was that 2025 mark. <coughs> so, and that's for completion of the project. Do you know? That sounds right. Yes. Okay. So the building would have to be built by then. And we also had Charlie Arlinghouse who came and talked about the difference between what's in the bill, which I think is 15 million at Senate Bill 1, and what he sort of anticipated the actual cost would be. So I'm assuming we can't get additional ARP, ARPA money. So would that be general funds that we would be looking at? So I, I don't know the answer to that because I don't know what's available in ARPA beyond the 15 million. There could be additional beyond that, but 15 was what was put aside for this project based on the, the 15 million came from the estimates that were given by DAS back at the original committee that, that Representative Edwards is the only surviving member of. <laughs> um, that may not last much longer. <laughs> <laughs> the other four members are no longer in, in the legislature. Um, but that that committee received an estimate at that time of 15 million. Of course, since that time, we have seen major changes yeah. in inflation, workforce, labor costs, and everything else yielding what was the higher estimate. Um, I did get an answer on your other question about the ARPA funds. Um, 
it needs to be obligated by 123124 and needs to be I'm sorry I can't read spent. spent by 123126 is what my colleague here is telling me oh. oh okay so that's considerably longer amount of time to spend them yeah, we need to be obligated by 123124. So I guess that would mean you'd have to have a contract with the construction company by okay. then. Okay. So if the process was, you know, a two year design process waiting for, you know, an approval of which way to go, that would make that very difficult. But great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Representative Verf. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have three questions for Mr. Ripson, if that's okay. So the first one is, I get hopefully an easy one regarding the ARPA funds. Do we know those funds can be used to build a prison? That is, um, I didn't do that analysis, but the folks at uh, Gopher, which I'm remember, I'm not remembering what that stands for, but I think everybody in here knows what Gopher is. Um, they've they've done that analysis and said yes. Okay. Could you just get us that information, that you know, actual hard copy that says a lawyer said we can do this? Um, I really appreciate that. Um, then two questions related to the changing of the date and staffing. So specifically regarding just sort of keeping the staff, my understanding from your previous testimony was one of the issues has been that we're talking March 1st, so everybody's bailing out. But now we're talking basically the end of the next biennium, which is a significant, which we could even go further if you feel that's necessary. But wouldn't just having a two plus year extension tell the staff that we are going that they still have jobs it's not like the thing is going to close suddenly underneath their feet it would certainly be better than the status quo absolutely be better than the status quo i think what would be best would be to show that we actually have a vision for the future and a pathway for the future but it would be better than the status quo and the last question is kind of related to that and you and i've talked about this um, a little bit regarding the trauma informed therapies um you indicated that a big part of the problem sort of related to right now this sudden closure was the people didn't you weren't gonna get the people to do it because it was going to be closing but again with that longer time period to work with couldn't this trauma-informed process begin within the existing facility knowing that eventually it would be transformed or, or transferred as well uh, to yeah. the new facility understanding that new facility will be better yeah i mean it's possible right it's all dependent upon our ability, as I said last time, to secure a steady, stable workforce. So if, in fact, that is, that's enough to help us secure a steady, stable workforce, then yes, it would be possible for us to start implementing those new programs. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Representative Mooney, you, you had a question quite a while ago. Or did you get it addressed? Thank you. Uh, no, I didn't. It was bringing it back to the discussion of where plans would go uh, upon designs. Oh. And my thought, and I'm trying to keep track here of all the outstanding issues we have floating in the room. So at a point uh, appropriate, I'd yeah. like to make that as one of my points. Thank you. All right. So, um, so I would like to make my request to the division and then we'll go on go around and and hear what you think because mr ripple needs to take notes and and make an amendment i am going to ask for you to support keeping this appropriations language for the design and site evaluation in the amendment that we produce now and i i think that that is a, a good thing to do because it's inevitable in any ways to, to, to get this design and a site evaluation process started. We've heard the department say that the, the, the co-location shared services is a good model to reduce operating costs over the long run. We're gonna see some numbers on that. I, I, I think uh, that yes, if we kick the can down the road through the next fiscal year, that will help some uh, to, 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 for their employment situation. But I, I can't help but to think that from a morale perspective, if they know that we're actually going to start to do the work that we've been talking about for a decade of planning what the future looks like, that that says something that a, a mere delay does not say. So, so I am, I'm asking for your support on continuing to have the essence of this paragraph 
on the appropriation for the design and build in it. And so um, that's my request. Yes or no, uh, Representative Weiler? I'll support it. How much money do you want to have for design? Um, we, we've got two million in here. This was a straight to, up design. Since then, we've kicked around the idea of two <laughs> designs, a small and a medium. And so, I don't know if two million still passes that sanity check. But, but that 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 that's the amount that's in there. Yes, sir. Yeah, I can, we've got it already on paper. Let's go with it. Representative Walner, it's your it's your amendment. Yes or no. Yes, let's leave the design money in. If Th thank you so much. Uh, do you want to wait or do you want to say now, Representative Talersky? I just wanted to comment. Didn't we hear last week um, from Mr. Arlinghouse that that is an appropriate amount? He said it, he thought it would be 1.8, 1.9. You know, that's an excellent memory. When, when it was just a single design, he said 1.6 is the number he shared. Yes, good point. So if, so 2 million ought to be... Yeah, I'm yeah. just clarifying that. Yes, good point. Yeah, I um, after hearing the timeline of the ARPA funds, I think I would um, want to see what we could do to get going. So, so that's, that's, that's a, yes. a yes? Okay, Representative Hall? Yes, and I think we're back to... Rep what Representative Mooney was discussing, which is if they have two conceptual designs, who and when they are shared is something that still needs to be worked out. I have, I have no issues with kicking them off to do the work. This is a fairly significant thing to do. Sending it just through fiscal may not be the right solution. I don't know what the timing is to have two conceptual designs done, but I would like to see the two conceptual designs come back for review Maybe the, the languages they sent are sent to the House Speaker and the Senate President and the House Senate House Speaker and Senate President determine how that information is shared in the, their respective bodies. We will come back to that. I just got in yes or no at this point. Re Re Representative Irv? I'm very uncomfortable with uh, doing something with so many questions still outstanding and find it hard to believe that a four-month delay is the end of the world. I mean, if the whole committee wants to go along with this, I'll, I'll go along, but I think it's not necessary and short-sighted, um, especially given that we have so many members of not only our committee, but the HHS committee, which presumably will now have a chance to look at this, the bigger picture now, over the coming months, who are new members and don't have the same kind of background, depth of background that a number of us have here from working on, and me only for a few terms, but others for decades, apparently. Um, so if, if the if the census to go along, I'll go along. But um, but I think it's not a good idea. Okay, for the purposes of the Strava, I'll just think of you as, as a no. I I, I want to answer uh, the point. Uh, this this has been with children and family law, not HHS. And I know you know that. My but, apologies. Uh, but uh, they have had their batting practice on HB one twenty. And HB 120 ended up getting amended in children and family law to include um, a, an amendment that makes it look identical to the Senate's version that, that got passed of SB 1. They've been asked to retain HB 120. I had an opportunity to speak with their vice chair yesterday and said, hey, so what do you think about HB 120? You know, you got some new, new people over there uh, what do you think? And he says he thinks it would have passed uh, if they had uh, gotten the committee to do it. He thinks he'd have lost about four people. Um, but otherwise, it would have passed with an OTP, a recommendation out of committee. But it's been retained. Yes, sir. May I respond? Yes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Mm -hmm. I understand that. Um, I, I know Representative Long um, as well. It's not an issue of whether it would have passed or not passed. I think it was I went to the hearing, um, and actually I didn't. I was kind of surprised that it, I don't think they've actually voted it out of committee yet. Um, but my concern was sitting at that meeting that yes, the people might vote for it, but that doesn't mean that they feel they're informed. I mean, I've sat through this for several terms, and I still learn new things. So I'm I'm skeptical not only the people on that committee, but on ours who are new that they really have a depth of knowledge of what we're talking about here and the trade-offs uh, going forward. Thank you. 
fair, fair point. Uh, or uh, for this acquisition money, do you think you're a yes or a no? Uh, I'm not there yet, but uh, I'm I'm moving along. I I think I need to, um, you know, I'm just very concerned that we're 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 moving towards a, a center that uh, uh, is going to adopt uh, the uh, reputational uh, challenges that come with the existing center, and um, there may actually be uh, other ways to support uh, these families and these kids uh, without. Uh, a new a new facility, let alone uh, deciding the exact size. So, so, so you're holding out um, a belief that one of the options that will be viable is no replacement, other than extending the system of care, maybe or something. Yeah, perhaps. Perhaps. And, and okay. I'm I'm sure I could be brought up to to speed some more and 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 talk with the commissioner, but. Uh, um, yeah, I've, I still have a few questions, and whether the two million would be well spent or not. Thank, thank you. Th 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 just, thank you. Uh, just a comment. Yes, sir. The group that evaluates proposed construction is not the fiscal committee; it's the public works committee. They have a lot of experience at doing this and looking at buildings, and that's what they do. The whole uh, HB twenty five comes from their analyses. So this would be in that. That would be the place this would go, that and governor and council, who also look at construction contracts. Fiscal committee doesn't, doesn't look at construction contracts. I, I, I am so glad you gave me a, uh, an authentic dodge to get out of this issue here in the very, <laughs> very near term, <laughs> Representative Mooney. That answers my question. Thank you, Representative Weiler. Got it. So now it's to you. Yes or no on the acquisition money? On $2 million is the question? Yes, I'm good with that. Okay, and, and so am I. So, so let's go ahead, uh, Ms. Ripple, and include that in the fresh amendment. Um, and then on the issue, this is a little tiny issue, and hopefully we can just zip now that we've done this once. Um, I, I think we need to go ahead and put in there that we want two options. We want the 6 to 12, we want the 12 to 18, because I think those are going to look different. Um, uh, so what, what, what do you say to that representative Weiler? Yeah, it, it's a good thing. And, and by the time that's done, we may have some more experience in which progress and how it's moving. And I, I think Mr. Ribson has a pretty good handle on it, what's happening. And like he says, we're the lowest. So things are happening. Well, maybe it's the population we have. Uh, we just thank, thank, thank hope you. they don't keep sending MS 13 members to our state. Uh, thank you, Representative Walner. Yes or no on the two designs? You know, that that's not the most important thing to me right now. The most important thing to me is I'd really like to hear, I would like to see the site evaluation and where it's going to be, to me, is what I would like to, if I were going to prioritize what we would do first. I think coming down to the point of where we're going to do this building is more important right now to me. So, so we just appropriated that money though in the amendment, so, right? So it's going to take months and we're probably not going to see it till January. But in the meantime, when they show up in January, should they show up with, with two, two designs, uh, probably on the same sites? It's, uh, this is not affecting the site evaluation. This is, a, this is affecting, you know, the options of the next legislature has. Well, it could affect the site evaluation. I mean, it could affect it. I mean, one site might not be large enough to put in an 18 bed and another site might, I mean, depends on where, I don't know where these building sites are at this point. Yeah. So are you a yes or a no on the two sites uh, evaluation? I want to hear what, sites, I want to hear what two Mr. De two designs. I want to hear what Mr. Ripson has to go, say. Go ahead. Sure. So um, as we said before, there's three possible sites that are being considered. One would be to remain on the current campus, which obviously has some disadvantages, both from right the, the awful history that associated with that campus and um, with the fact that you wouldn't have a shared services model being able to be effectuated on that campus. You wouldn't have those the benefits that you would get. The other two options that have been considered are within proximity to New Hampshire Hospital or within proximity to Hampstead hospital because those two sites you'd be able to have um, a shared services model 
and those two sites offer somewhat different ability to share services. Um, certainly things like, you know, facilities, laundry, food, those things, both options give you the opportunity for shared services. Um, for things like clinical services and education, uh, nursing too, you could share across both of those. But for things like clinical services and education, you'd get more opportunity at a site like Hampstead because they serve, you know, a youth population in a way that they don't currently serve at New Hampshire Hospital. Um, but there is work that is anticipated to be done through the through the contract with the design firm to look at the sites and ensure that we have, you know, an appropriate place to, to, to do that, you know, to, to put a building for that purpose. And how long do you think the site evaluation, at what point do you think you'll be ready with saying where you, which site is the best site for you? So we've, you know, as I've said before, we did start, we, no contracts are signed yet, but we did start the process um, with Public Works to try to identify an architect and design firm, and that part of that contract was to help us with the site evaluation work. Um, that's one of the first parts of the design process, but I I don't remember in the timeline that was proposed what the, what the timeline was for the site evaluation component of it. Um, but the goal was to have that ready to go as soon as we were given the funding and authority to, to do so from this body and the governor. Okay, thank you. Okay. I'd like to continue going around the table just to get yes or no on the two design versus one design. But do you, do you represent Weiler, do you wanna say something now? I just wanted to add one of the little surprises that come about sometime. Before the present youth center was built, I was headed tour of, of the, uh, the DCYF. It seems like the meals were catered and brought in to each living unit, and there were several different units. So now we open this, this center, and the, the whole thing was, oh, we didn't have to worry about the security and moving from building to building and have security. So we're going to have them all in one building where they can't j jump away and run out. So we go, and we said, first thing we said, so how did we save? Oh, sorry. It's more expensive to operate. Why is that? Well, now we have a kitchen, and we have to have staff there 18 hours a day, which we never had before. And so why didn't they figure this in? You know, this is the thing that disturbs me, that I don't know what they were paying for the meals brought in, but when you have four or five people there 18 hours a day, that was, that was quite a, a big change in cost and I, you, one you still have with all those all that kitchen for the, the low population so we've got to think of these things that's why it's important to have the shared services so you know we don't have the, this kitchen set up to feed 140 people and now it's feeding a lot less so that's one of the things I just it's one of the things I recall that was surprised they hadn't calculated this in uh, thank you for that uh Representative Tlersky, one design, two designs. Honestly, I don't think I have enough knowledge to actually speak to that because I don't have This the is history. the one place you get to abstain. I I think okay. I would abstain, although I will I will say that the the lack of the site at this point is concerning to me also, um, because I feel like we're just shooting in the dark not knowing where we're going so to hear that it sounds like one of those sites is potentially eliminated if we're talking about the sununu center then i guess that makes me a little more comfortable um but i do feel like we're deciding something that we're not sure where it's going and i would really love more of a staged approach but i at this point will i will back off from giving a, a commitment to the beds. So, so let, me, let me ask this question then. Do you, do you, do you know if there's any uh, geography limitations? That's not the right word. But uh, could, could, could we build an 18 bed facility near the New Hampshire hospital? Because they, they have swamp issues and not a lot of buildable land. Is that, is that even, is to, I think Representative Walner brings up the point, we got to worry about the site. Well, if one of those sites can't support an 18-bed facility because of the location, 
then then that does sort of start to limit what we might see in the future. Yeah, and I I don't know the answer to that, right? The the state office campus, you know, there's there are there's land around there, but the viability of all that land, and there's also unused buildings around there that maybe the space that those buildings are on would be appropriate space as well. So that's part of what the site review process would be looking at. Okay, uh, Representative Hull, do you one one design or two designs? I would be in favor of two. Uh, Representative Irv. I have more points to make based on this. <laughs> well, this is really the point. We have a whole raft of questions that are just coming up right here in this short meeting that we've had. And let's start there. I, mean, I agree with Representative Solorski. I think the department's already eliminated the Sununa site. And I don't have a problem with that, but that was pretty clear when a moment ago he said, we, these shared services are a big part of the cost savings, which says to me we've also eliminated the Hampshire Hospital because they also just recently said that essentially the best cost savings would be achieved at uh, the, at the um, Hampstead Hospital site. Also, I'm, is public works going to then be deciding whether we go with a 6 to 12 or a 12 to 18? Is that part of this? Is that how this siting thing is, is working out? Um, so I, I, it, <laughs> I'm just frustrated that this, we have all these questions that are coming up from around the committee room, and here we are saying, well, we'll just throw $2 million in and get the ball rolling. Thank you. I don't think so. So I'm a yes because decision. I'd rather. I, I'm sorry. I should say I'm a yes to your question because I think we should both be, should be considered. I don't think this is the right way to do it. All right. So so you're a yes to two 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 designs. And Representative Weiler, did you have something to say? I don't think Public Works would decide on what the size of it should be. They will decide on things like where it would be, what kind of structure it would be, how it would be built, and and things like that. Um, but they would look at the proposal. They would look at the two proposals, if there's two different sizes, and say, you know, here's what needs to be done in this one, here's what needs to be done in that one. They may be able to give us some figures of what the final cost would be. But I don't think they would step in and say, this is the one you got to build, not this one. I don't think they would get in at, at that level. They're just going to evaluate what is proposed before them. I, I, right. I, I, and I, I just would want to add that um, I, I feel like uh, I've been looking at this exact same issue since the, uh, the bill came to us two years ago in Division Three. I mean, it's essentially the same conversation, except we're getting smarter, we're getting deeper. But, but the terrain of what we're talking about, I think, is largely unchanged. Uh, it's my perspective. Um, do you have a one versus two design? Yeah, assuming I get there, uh, get that far, I would say that I would prefer to to one. Thank you. All right, Representative Mooney. Absolutely, on two. I think it's customary for architects, first of all, in their designs, to have multiple options, and second of all, we've heard repeatedly from this gentleman here that 18 is a reasonable number to go forward. So that has got to be explored. Thank you. Uh, thank you, and I'm I'm also a two. Okay, so so that. We've teed this up now a couple times. When they get these designs, how are we going to get to the decision of build X or build Y or build something totally Z-like? What, what, what's the process? I, I hear we want to do some public works uh, pass through. To uh, what, I, I don't know how to do this. I have no clue on how to do this. We got the expert here. He's looking at what's happening nationwide. I don't know that, I don't trust that the present administration not to be packing us full of illegal immigrants, some of which will be gang members. Here, let's stay on topic. Well, that's a possibility. They're being sent all over the country. So we've got to, we've got to be aware of that. And here's the expert. He's going to be very attuned to what's happening. And we're going to look at another year or two of experience and see, so what are the, What's the trend? What are you seeing? And then he's going to make the decision of what he thinks is best for us. And it's not going to come down to us. It's going to come down to the experts. So, What's the real experience? What do we need? What is working? And that's so, at so, that point we, we choose. So is it, who is the we choose? Is it, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to interpret what I think I just heard you say. And it sounded like you implied, Representative Weiler, that that we would let the department choose between the design options. And I, I, don't, I don't think that's what you mean, but that's what I think I heard. That's what I mean. We would let the department advise us what was best. 
Okay, so they would be in an advisory role, uh, but who would make the decision? I, I, I just want to know who will make the decision. Is it the uh, GNC? Is it is it is it a governor? Is it who? I mean, because I, I assume we need to write something in saying we're getting this data. Somebody's going to have to do something with this data. The, the, the big thing we need is a decision. So we make we make the laws. We put it in law. This is what's funded. This is what we want. That's the decision. Oh, okay, Rep Representative Walner, do you have thoughts on this? Uh, who who decides how to decide? Well, I think the legislature decides. We'll make the final decision. I don't really think you leave that up to the administration to make that decision. I think that's it's a legislative. We would appropriate the funds for whichever model we went with, and that's a legislative. That's our job, um, and I don't think we would leave it up to anyone else. Where, where would it? Where, in your view, where would it enter the legislative process? Probably have to come in as a piece of legislation. As a, a separate piece of legislation, I imagine it would. Would would okay. Now you're going to have two options, so I think you would probably have to have some sort of legislation to say we're picking option A or B. So, so let's let's get ready to park that after Representative Talerski has her opportunity to speak. I just have a question that perhaps you all can answer for me: Who would be considered the experts in this therapeutic? approach of care to these children is it children and family law is it health and human services nelly fairs is it you guys i'm who has that knowledge well it, it's the department it's in, in the executive branch but within the legislature um uh hhs would probably be better qualified from an evaluation of the therapeutic model than any of the other committees you mentioned. Children and Family Law is interested in the, you know, sort of the child welfare impacts and implications. We're worried about it from the financial aspects. Public Works is worried about it from, is this the right construction have we thought of everything as the bonding right? I, you know, I don't know what all they do. But so I don't, I don't think there's one, uh, one answer or, or 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 one committee that can answer everything but to your question i think the best qualified is hhs okay thank you so it, so it, let, could, let, it might come down to here's the bigger building here's the smaller building the bigger building is only a million dollars more wow why don't we just go with that then we'd have room I mean, it's, it's going to be a difference in the costs and all that sort of thing. And from the costs we're looking at now, I remind us that the original SYSC was built for about $20 million. <coughs> now we're looking at, a, I don't know, 12 to 18 bed for the same price. Much smaller building. So, 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 so what I'd like to do is I'd like to park this issue on how we uh, get a decision out of the legislature because I think later I want to talk about <clears throat> something that's in SB1 related to the commission, that the Senate, it was important to them. And so when, when we get a chance to bring that back up, I think this topic may fit within that. So let, let's park that. Um, I, think, I think we just worked through the appropriations issue. <clears throat> uh, Rep, or Mr. Ripple, what, 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 read that. Read what you think we've agreed to so far. Uh, well, so far, I think you've agree agreed to keep the dates in Representative Wallner's amendment, or at least that's my understanding, the June 30th, 2025. You've agreed to keep the $2 million appropriation. Uh, it sounds like the members would prefer two options, although what happens with those two options is yet to be decided. Um, so that's what I have so far. That's, that's a fair summary from my point of view. So, so next up, let's talk about the operations money to get from one March to the end of the fiscal year. I, I think the 1.5 million number has been floated and vetted a few times. Um, uh, you had mentioned 1.6 at one point, just in passing, but then you were comfortable with 1.5. So, so what do you, what do you think the real answer is? 
I am comfortable with 1.5. When I when we sat down with our fiscal folks, the current shortfall was 1.6. And again, that was because of revenues that we weren't going to be able to draw in. It was because of overtime burning much higher than anticipated. Also because we had a number of retirements that were unanticipated. When somebody retires, the state has to pay out leave time in a large lump sum. Um, and some of those employees <clears> were very <throat> long-term employees with a lot of banked time. So that all comes out of the budget as well. <clears throat> okay, so we've, we've written somewhere, Mr. Ripple, a paragraph on the 1.5 million. I can't put my fingers on it. It's in the bill as introduced. Okay, can you can you just grab it and, and inherit it into this amendment? Yes. Okay, uh, you could do that. Is there anyone that disagrees with the 1.5 additional? Okay, all right. Um, Okay, so if we were to stop right there, we've achieved success, right? I, but I don't want to stop right there. And the reason, there, no, no, no. I, and, and I'll tell you why, though. I, I, I think <clears throat> the Senate, using the Committee of Conference and using a pretty deliberative process, came up with some elements that they put into SB1 at least one of them, I think, was absolutely critical to getting them the 24 to nothing support. And if we're going to send SB1 back to them uh, and say, hey, this, this is what we're going to do, take it or leave it, I would at least like to sweeten the pot a little bit to show that we know the hard work that they did. So, so I would like to bring your attention to my amendment 0192. I'll give you a moment to, to grab it. I, I have one. Do you have one, Representative Stringham? No, okay. Oh, okay. This, is, this should be amendment two. Yeah, it's to the uh, amendment to HB forty nine. That's what we're discussing. So this is an amendment to forty nine. It lay numbered zero one nine two. Okay, I would ask you to flip to page five and note from lines one down to 34, there's a, a new subdivision on the Commission to Study Public Safety of the Secured Youth Development Center. Okay, now, what what is this paragraph in terms of the discussion process? When this was not in SB1, this was not in the first amendment to SB1, I'll, I'll just refer to casually as the Carson Amendment to the to the SB1. This was in the second amendment. This was essential to uh, to securing the support of at least two senators that represented uh, Hampstead, the Hampstead area. So so the Senate had to work its way through it. And this commission that they uh, said should be established, uh, I, I think is probably still a good idea uh, and could help for the next part of the discussion is what do we do with these two options later? You know, maybe this commission could have some role in that. But I'm going to shut up and give you a few moments to read lines 1 through 34 without me blaring in your head.
Uh, yes, sir, Mr. R Representative Weiler. All right. I represented Hampstead in my district for 20 years, and now I, it's not in my district, but this is uh, Representative Birdsell's complaint uh, that I have discussed with her. At the Sonoma Youth Center, the Manchester police are frequently called. I remember having a conversation with someone who had been a Manchester policeman who had uh, captured the runaways, if you will. And that was when it was not closed in like it is now. Um, her concern was the state police from Massachusetts are closer than the state police from New Hampshire to Hampstead. And the sheriff is, is still like 12 miles away. Uh, the local police, it's not that big a department. They still have local police, but I think they may still have a part-time chief. There's about three towns around me that have part-time chiefs, which isn't a bad thing, but they're not always there every day. So there is some, uh, but there is full-time police evidence in, in the town of Hampstead. That was her concern. Did they have enough manpower if they had to say an all-out search, someone's run away, or three have run away, or something like that? And, you know, they've, they've had people leave the Hampstead Hospital. That doesn't seem to be that big a deal. Uh, it's the same, one of the same populations. So, troubled youth. So, um, I think she's overly concerned with this, but obviously they did this to get her vote. What they want to do is, is get an, an evaluation of the... Um, of the security of the site. I don't see it as a problem because most of the commission is, is going to be legislators and we're not paying them a lot. But one of the other things that we have to remember that may serve in this group is last budget we put up a hundred million dollars for abuses by staff of the, of the children. A hundred million dollars and now all the lawyers are foaming at the mouth and lining up. But anyway, what this thing could look into is what is the, what is the um, oversight of the people within this facility to ensure this never happens again? And, and who, is, who is making sure and what is, what is the type of security within the system? I think that's just as important as figuring out where the nearest police department is. And hopefully this commission will work on that because we don't want to have a repeat of what we've gone through. Thank you. Okay, so the topic that I'm, I'm trying to have us focus on is do we want to lift this language from Amendment 0192 lines 1 through 34 and include it in, um, I'm still going to call it the Walner Amendment for now, um, and maybe, maybe this needs to be tweaked to be as inclusive as Representative Weiler just suggested, but but uh, but I but I want to get the sense of the of the division on whether it adds value to include this language, and I, I propose it does. I think they've got some good things to be looking at in parallel. There's an, an ongoing group of people that can continue to continue to discuss this, um, and. And plus, we would be reflecting back a major piece of SB1 to the Senate to say, we listened to you, we heard you, this was a good idea, we're on board. So, so I think that is how we help ourselves get to yes. So, Representative Walner, your thoughts? Well, again, this, it feels like to me that this piece goes right back to needing to know where the site is. Um, that's seems to me that's one of the major things that needs to be decided because this this is really about community involvement it's really about Hampstead. yeah well and it's but it could be about concord and it might be about manchester i mean we don't really know for sure and maybe no maybe in the end there's some other place that materializes um you know i think involving the communities is a really good idea um i'm not sure i mean i i would not object to putting this in um but i'm not sure we're really ready because we don't really know how many commit how many commissions are we going to have we're going to have three of them running at the same time for each site that's a possibility or is there going to be some decision about the site by the time this commission is in place 
And I do notice that this commission and this part of um, Senate Bill, or it was Senate Bill 1, um, really does also say that they're going to bring in legislation in November of 2023. Um, oh, okay, on or before. So they're 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 anticipating additional legislation on this matter. Um, Just to read the line that I I think uh, uh, Representative Walner is accurately uh, citing, uh, it says the commission shall submit a preliminary report including its findings and any recommendations for proposed legislation. So if they don't have proposed legislation, they wouldn't include it. Right. If they did, they would. Right. And that that would be done before uh, the November 1 of 2023, which gives um, the site evaluation design team some room to work, because I think you're really close to letting that contract once you have the authority to do it. So. So hopefully come September, October, there's some information that's going to be going to this commission if we establish it for them to exercise another set of eyes on this. So my, my only point was that there, you can see that they're already anticipating that they would bring in legislation. Yes, Additional legislation would come in around the um, new, new Sununu Center. Right. Okay. So you're you're okay with that? I I could live with this piece being in it. It's really, I mean, it's I don't I don't know that it adds a lot or mm -hmm. doesn't, but I like the idea of communities being involved. Okay, thank you, Representative Tlersky. Do you do you want me to come back to you, or do you have an opinion on this? No, my only comment was I'm not sure I'm reading this the same way that um, Representative Weiler did in terms of the commission would have oversight over the the safety of the facility itself. Um, and I perhaps I just am misunderstanding how it's being written, but I thought, you know, I'm reading it as a community based public safety um, situation. I don't know if anyone could clarify that i you know this is why when after representative weiler was done talking i said this would be the bulk of it and then we could tweak it if we needed to to make sure it incorporated his concern but but i i, I think i think you're you're right that this language itself does not really bring them to the task of figuring out public safety within it's it's mostly a coordination function with the external and knowing the senator that wanted it in there, that was basically about it. It wasn't about within this, the facility, but I think that should be a consideration. And if the commission was formed, I would suggest it to them. Yeah. So, so because this is the language in, that is in SB1 as amended that for the Second Amendment, I, I would like to include this t t to tell the Senate, look, we listened. We're tr we tried to meet you where we could. I guess I don't really have an opinion on it. All right, uh, Representative Hull. Oh, did you have an, another thing you wanted to say, though? Okay, Representative Hull. Thank you, Chairman. Um, no strong opinions either way. I do think we're putting the cart before the horse, and I say that because of line 16 and 8 through 18, right? This presupposes that we know which town we're in if we're trying to get a representative from a local law enforcement agency or municipal governing body. Um, and then I think if we're going to wholesale pick this up and put it in, we need to go past lines 35. We have to go all the way to the end of page, um, at least line two, maybe line three on page six, because there's some repeals of this section of the law that would be incorporated. So no strong opinions, but I think the site selection is the nine is the big thing we should be talking about and whether if there was anything that would be the commission to put in this amendment that there is a well-defined site commission maybe that language exists from some other bill from someplace before put that in here i think that's the key element of this just just say your last sentence again i i, I got distracted looking for something sure so I think the key element is 
making sure the site selection committee is part of this amendment if we were going to do something because that's the piece of this puzzle that needs to be solved long before we get to page five. I'm, I'm suggesting this could double as a site selection committee, particularly if we added a, a line to make that part of the, their charter. There, without, We have not yet designated what a site selection committee would look like. We're not there yet. Go ahead. I have a question for either um, Mr. Rivson or Mr. Ripball, right? And this is naiveness on my part due to just coming up to speed on this bill. Where are we on site selection? What was authorized by statute before when? There was, there was nothing authorized by statute specific to site selection. This went through the entire process last year all the way to Committee of Conference with almost no conversation about site selection. That was going to be, it seemed, left to the department and governor to resolve. Um, but in this session, that has become the pressing issue, at least in the Senate, and a, and a pressing issue here in the House. Thank you. Question for the chair. Yes. Would it be possible to have a draft of a site selection committee amendment kind of based on what is on page five, but with a focus more about site selection because the personnel might be different that way and you might in fact have representatives speaking to line 16 16 through 19 from all three communities that are currently in um that are currently under consideration right members from hampton members from concord members from manchester sorry Ham hampstead having those as part of this to make this both the focus of this to be more than just safety, but to be site selection, and that there's representatives from the public from the areas of interest. That seems so, to make so, sense. So, so let me uh, let me respond to that the way I would I would deal uh, incorporate what you just said. On line 16, I would change the phrase "a representative" to saying representatives from local law enforcement agencies. Make that plural. So that that line basically says bring in the potential sites. And similarly, uh, do the same thing with line 18. Representatives from municipal governing bodies. That, that way they could make the, they could tailor the commission more to the, you know, sort of Concord, Hampstead, Manchester thing. Um, that, that would be my approach to, to dealing with an aspect of what you just said. The, the other part, I would say up there in line five, six, seven, somewhere in there, basically add an additional clause to that first sentence. So it reads something like, and I'll let Mr. Ripple wordsmith this if you're okay with the idea, is... Um, on line five, there is established a commission to study the public safety of the Secured Youth Development Center and site selection considering the surrounding communities. And, and that way we get the, the site selection mission into the charter of the commission. Yes, sir. If I may. Yep. Um, thank you. I would put it... I would wordsmith it slightly differently, so I'll propose it, right? There is established a commission to study the location of and the public, right? And then to study the public safety of. I, I, I don't, that's fine. I think okay. it's the same meaning. Yep. Yours is probably superior language. Okay. I'll defer to Mr. Ripple, who actually has to generate <laughs> a note for OLS. So if that's okay, because we, we we're going to review this tomorrow. Um, but do you, do you think you have, have we confused you or are you on top of this? No, I think I get it. So you want to add basically the committee that's in section six of this amendment or Senate bill one, uh, add site selection to the charge somewhere around line five, uh, pluralize representatives from local law enforcement agencies and representatives from municipal governing bodies on line 16 through 18. And I think otherwise it would stay the same. Now, do you want to keep the reporting dates down on lines 32 and 33 as is? Uh, I, I, think, I think we wanted to keep the first one as is. The second one starts to feel a little superfluous. 
like like it just got added because the all these commissions have two reporting dates and that's sort of a generic second reporting date so I, I don't I don't have a strong opinion on the second reporting date go ahead go ahead represent whole thank you um, so in lines probably 32 right um, recommendations for proposed legislation um, both for right and location I think if we're tasking them to be a site selection they should be recommending a location as well so um, and I don't know whether and someone else may be able to speak to it a November 1st 2023 deadline is the right deadline for a proposed location or should that be sooner it, it does say or before so there's there's nothing in here that forces them to wait good point okay representative Walner. So I, I, I know that this um, there's a lot of concern about public safety and this um, program for um, young people. But, you know, this pretty much focuses on law enforcement. But I do know, as just being from Concord, I do know that we often, a lot of, a lot of things around the state buildings that we're concerned about is the fire, how much the fire department can respond. I mean, we have, do have the prison, we have a number of, we have a number of um, buildings here in the, in the Capitol that we have to respond to with our fire department. And this really, this seems to be only law enforcement. I do see there is a line here that talks about a representative for municipal government, but I do think that communities are real the fire and ambulance services for these kinds of facilities are as important i think as the law enforcement I, so. if, if if i may as as a member of the cheap seats watching the senate go through all this oh, negotiation okay. i wasn't there you, you you're absolutely right fire was was part okay. of that concern it i'm i'm like you a little surprised it didn't make it into the commission language and and i would just say that they didn't ignore it though the way they dealt with that i think is on the very front page um line 24 where it reads the department shall to the extent practical practicable implement any reasonable requests by the communities to ensure the safe operation of the facility, implement a payment in lieu of taxes arrangement to prevent the shifting of costs to local taxpayers and ensure cooperation with the prospective community. So, so that was meant to be, you know, uh, sit down with a community, work out community support requirements and implications, and let's figure out what we, the state owes you for that support. So, so they didn't ignore it. They just didn't put it into the commission charter. And, and, and I, I, I'm sort of foreshadowing, but, but this line from 22 down to 33 on page one feels, feels like something that could be in the Walner Amendment or doesn't need to be. Um, but if, it, if we don't include this because we think this is good budget fodder for HB2, then, then maybe, maybe to your point about fire and maybe other local ser services, because I don't know if I mean, uh, do we do we list them all? Sewer, water. No. You know, no. I mean, so so if, if there's some generic way to tell the commission that they're looking at more than the public safety issue, but they're lo looking at you know c community support arrangements, which include public safety fire etc would 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 that well i think it would be i mean it would be the charge of this commission i would right. think to look at right and we could say something. i think having the representative from the municipal government yep probably that person is probably going to bring those things up right right um so so, so, so. mr ripple just just to help make sure that they we, we, we don't let have them obsess on public safety on 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 line five there is established a commission to study the community impacts of the secured youth development center to the to the surrounding communities to include 
public safety, fire, et cetera. I, 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 think, I think that gets us all in line with where we want we go. to go. Yes, sir. Having done um, a lot of site plans when I was on planning board, one of the firemen came in at one point. They were building a nice building, and it was had some very tall trees in the back, and they thought that was nice having these trees around. And the fireman said, if this building catches on fire, we want to be able to fight the fire from all sides. You have to have access to the rear of the building, the sides of the building. Otherwise, we're not as successful at putting out the fire. We have to be able to get the trucks and whatever all the way around the building, get a good sight of where, where the fire's coming out, where we have to start to, to fight the fire. And it, it made a very logical statement that none of us ever thought of before. Yeah, you call the fire department, you've got this nice building, all trees surrounded and just front lawn, and that's the only place they can fight it, from the front. But the fire might have started in the back, and they can't even see it till when they drive up. So that's the kind of thing that a fire department will come in and talk about um, that most of us don't think about. But I, I think that, you know, the idea of having some firemen come take a look at this proposal is, is probably a good idea. Okay, I'm, maybe this will just go real quick. In or out, yes or no, add the commission with the uh, qualifiers that, that I said to Mr. Ripple. Uh, Representative Weiler, yes or no? Add which? Add the commission from page... Yeah. Yes. Yes, add the commission. Yes. Representative Walner. Yeah, I'm fine with the commission. Uh, Representative Tlersky. I like the wording of the community impact um, over the public safety. I think it embraces more of what we need to learn. Okay. Keep keep your eye on that when we see the language tomorrow, Mr. Ripple. Uh, Representative Hull? No opinion either way. Or, uh, Representative Irv? So since I didn't get a chance to speak, I'm going to now. Um, I, I don't have a problem with the commission. I'll say that right off the bat. Although I don't understand what its intent is, what its purpose is, how it ties into the, the selection the choice of six or eight, uh, the, the 12 unit or the 18 unit. Um, I mean, it's an interesting concept, but it really, it's really not tied to the bill. I mean, we sort of started to tie it here, which is great. But again, these are all issues that we could take up with, a, with more time to actually get it right if it were done not under this rushed uh, time frame. So I'm okay with it being in there. Not sure what its purpose is at this point. Representative Stringham. Yeah, it's fine that it be added. Representative Mooney. Thank you. I would just say that, you know, when I read this, um, I see it as a commission on public safety. That is paramount. There is no question. And I don't really see that tied to one location or another, whether it's where it is now or where it will be with a site to be um, determined. Uh, I think a, my first choice would be almost periodic reviews uh, on certain deadline dates uh, into this legislation from these particular members of different departments and community safety uh, personnel over a commission. That would be my first choice. So I'll take a, a, a no opinion, I suppose, on the commission leaning no. Uh, okay, so so I think I think we have a, a close enough to yes. So. So let's let's go ahead and put that in there, um, and um, and and then your 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 point about the periodic reports. Yes. Um, you know the good news is that on page three, towards the bottom, starting at line twenty nine, there there was a reporting process, but uh, in an effort at this point to not snatch defeat from the jaws of victory. I would, I would like to put a cap on what we're going to ask of the Walner Amendment and carry these other things into an HB2 conversation. Is that, is that okay? Yeah. Okay. Um, so, so that's my proposal, that we, that we update the Walner Amendment uh, with the discussions and agreements we've made today. And we'll look at them tomorrow. They'll come in also looking like an SB1 am amendment as well, so that when the chair sends us to go do Division Three work, 
Well, looking at SB1, we've got something to consider. Comments, Representative Walner? Well, I'm going to bring up one, one issue that <clears throat> has been um, signaled to me. Um, the date that I put in was 2025. I mean, I think you saw the date, which is, is two years. We know the building's going to take longer than that to build. So I'm, I'm wondering if we push the date out or if we are just silent on the date. We just... My reaction silent. to that, I'm, I, the reason I was okay with the date that she selected is it gets us all the way through the next fiscal year. And, and since we're going to use the budget process for some of this, I was okay with tying it to the fiscal year process. If, however, you want to extend that that date that you proposed, I, I, I would be in favor and in support of, of you picking a date that's longer. I, I just was respecting your initial bid. So if, if you want a different date, what, 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 do, you, what do you think? I, I'm just, I, I would like to hear what other people think okay. uh, about that because, I mean, it just is something that I was thinking. No, we can't ask Mr. Rubin. Two years from now... Two years from now, we could be sitting here trying to, once again, we're right up against the deadline with no place, you know, the building's not done. I agree. Or what? I so, agree aggressively and violently. Should, so should we ask the department what they think? I just would like, I'd like to hear what the other members and, yeah. Uh, Representative Irv. What? <laughs> Can we hear from the department first, and then I'll speak up? Uh, uh, Mr. Ripson. So um, we, we found ourselves in this pickle because we set a date to close the facility when we didn't yet have a plan to replace the facility. And, um, you know, you, uh, Representative Edwards, wisely started us off with this process with a chart, and, and that was kind of the first disclaimer you made, right, that we, we put the cart before the horse, claiming that we were going to close this facility on a date certain without a plan yet to replace that facility. Um, and I very much were, and that put us in this place where not only did we not have a plan by the date, but the impact that that had on the workforce and the ability to operate the facility has been devastating. And I very much worry that having a closure date prior to having a viable operational place to go is going to cause us to repeat that same exact issue, whether it's obviously two years is better than three weeks. Um, but right. I think, you know, you need to have, you need to know where you're going next before you close what you have today. So you just said two things. You, you said we could either kick the date beyond the end of the next fiscal year to some other date certain, or I think what you really prefer is that we find a way to be silent on, on, on the next closure date. That's right. What SB1 actually says it does have a date by which the new facility is anticipated to be open, but it actually talks about the closure of SYC in terms of it shall be closed when the new facility is ready to accept children. And I think that's a more reasonable way to frame this, that when you when we have the replacement ready to accept children is, of course, the date that we would close the current facility. Okay. So I could find that language. I, 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 yeah, somewhere. I'm just I'm just now looking for that language. And of course I'm looking at I'm happy uh, to respond my amendment now. 0192. <laughs> Do what? I'm happy to respond now. All right. I would say remove the date. Okay. You said move we, or remove? Re remove. Thank you. Um and 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 so we got a remove option. And that's we've heard that option twice. So what you, if you can help us find that language, Mr. Ribson, because it is in there. Uh, does it start on the bottom of page one of my amendment line 33 where it starts upon opening the facility shall be referred to as blank. Um, nope, that's not it. 
Mr. Ripple found it. Um, page two, six through nine. The SYSC shall immediately, immediately be closed for detention or admission of any child when the secure treatment facility authorized by this chapter is sufficiently completed that children can be legally and safely housed there. Obviously, that language is not exactly perfect from what we're talking about, but I think there's a framework within there that that could be adjusted. There, there's some dates preceding that, March 1 of 2023 and November 1, 2024. What would you do with those dates? Would those you... were the dates by which um, the architect should be procured and by which the uh, project would be completed, which of course would no longer be relevant in the, the current framework that we're talking about. Well, maybe the procurement of the architect would still be um, relevant, but the... Um, the, the completion of the architectural and site evaluation work is, is time sensitive because we're trying to... Yep. So, so maybe leave the first date that would make sense to me. I wouldn't have any problem with that. And we've already, and actually what's, what's you know, that line anticipates that we're going to procure to do that. And in fact, the PW has already procured. We've already received three bids. We've already interviewed those folks and we're in the process of negotiating a contract, but are not going to execute a contract until we have authority and funding to do so. Okay. So you, you think you could procure the qualified architect by March one, or do you want a different date? Well, procurement just means starting that process. Right. We're already Go get passed. So yes, we could certainly procure cause we've already done it. But. Okay. Okay. And then the second date the have the project complete by November 24, that's impossible. That would be so, so just strike some of that. Yeah. I don't think that language would make sense in the current framework being discussed oh, okay but, but the date that the go that the um arpa money has to be used by as mm -hmm. as the yeah. you said there's a date has to the projects must be completed by oh. was it 2026 i i think the key date we heard was the date that the money needed to be obligated by it had to be obligated and again i want to be careful with this because i am not right the you're not the expert but but i think i heard the obligation date was the driver and, and from my and it was military comptroller I time be careful with this the obligation date is what drove tying up federal money if you have a an obligating document the notes you, the notes i have from the note that was handed to you before said obligated by 12 31 2024 spent by 12 31 2026 yep, that's what was handed to me but again I, even with that i'd want to be careful the people who do this work would be the right people to ask again this is not critical if we just take it out let's take it out let's take it out and but i, I do i do want um I, I'm, go ahead i'm sorry i was just going to say i think there still is the issue of we'd have to make sure and it might already be in here but the repeal of the current closure date has to be included yes so i assume mr ripple will probably take care of that for us as well right so i think that's so section one of both the bill as introduced house bill 49 as as introduced and representative walden's amendment 311h uh, they both deal with that uh closure date and so that was from house bill 2 from two years ago that's being amended here i think that would just need to be repealed uh, if you want what you want to do is include the language that you just discussed from senate bill one okay i i i think i'm good i think i'm confident that you have good notes and that you you can produce an amendment is is that good i think so um, I think there's still the question of I think there's still the question of the department is presenting two design options, but it's unclear who they're presenting them to. Uh, the committee from Senate Bill One does have some oversight as far as site selection, but It's not clear that the timing would overlap. So, for example, there's no timing mentioned uh, in Section 2 of this amendment. The department would come up with two possible options, but it doesn't say by a date certain, whereas the committee would need to issue its recommendations by November 1st. So there are some loose threads. So what if we said 30 September is no later than for the um, completion of the, the, the two options on the design? And that met, that marries up with that commission, but that still doesn't answer the question of 
who's actually going to make the decision. There's going to be legislation. Well, I think if you left in the language from the new commission, let me just find that here. They would present recommendations for proposed legislation on or before November 1st, 2023. So there would be legislation in um, 2024. Representative Hull. Thank you, Chairman. If the information was shared, I'm looking at lines 33 and 34, right? Sent to the Speaker of the House, President of the Senate, House Clerk, Senate Clerk, the Governor, and the State Library their findings would be sufficient to kick off how we deal with it as the legislature. Uh, I am very much in sync with Walner that the legislature should be the decision-making body and not, we shouldn't pass this off to somebody else. I'm not seeing any disagreement or anyone that feels like they have something to say to that. Representative Tlersky? Representative Tlersky? I'd just like to clarify something now that we started with the Walner Amendment with $2 million appropriated for the site evaluation, architect consult, consultation, et cetera. Now we have a commission that we're going to charge with the community impacts and the site selection. Are they going to have $2 million to spend? Is the department going to move forward with this original appropriation of $2 million? Like, where are we at with this? Because I'm a little confused how we got to this point and what the end goal is. Are we taking site selection away from the department that was going to have this $2 million for site selection? Let's. I just want to make sure we're all on the same page of what we're doing by changing. We're, we're not going to give politicians the $2 million. We're, we're going to let the executive department have the two million that's what that appropriation does the value of the commission is is basically to be an advisory board to be thinking bringing in the coordination of the communities and considering legislation that we could begin hearing in january of 24. so i understand that does how does that limit the department and how they move forward do they have to wait until the commission's done in November and issues recommendations before they can start some of this work. That's the disconnect. Oh, oh I no, have. they're, 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 well, they gotta go. The, this is why we had to pr go procure this architect on one March and, right. and, and we put, we just put a 30 September date to have the design completed no later than 30 September is what I said. Is it a different date? Yeah. If I could respond to, to that okay how long do they need for design so the the site review would definitely be done by that based on the conversations we've had the actual design work would take longer than that i think the anticipated design process was a little closer to a year um so they would have so the, i think but i think that with what i've heard right part of the idea is that when this committee starts meeting in september you'll know the site which with the site evaluation work done people will be able to make that decision about the site right or at least be better informed to make that decision about the site. But the full design process, I don't think will be done by September so, based on the, and again, DPW public works would be the best people to ask right. about that. No, but. no, I, I don't doubt you. So Mr. Ripple, when I was yakking earlier, I said 30 September for completion of, let's just make it the site evaluation recommendation. Okay. And you could, you could all just, you could also just leave it silent on the date. We could, but I sensed that people wanted to know that we were going to be making some progress. Okay. And and with this commission having to do its first report by the 1st of November and being dependent upon information being provided to it by this contractor, the contractor should have a date to shoot for with sort of the minimum essential information needed by the commission. So the minimum essential seems to be the site location. Is 30 September adequate? For the site evaluation, I think so. And I, you know, I, I don't have in front of me the actual scope that was proposed, but I remember the site evaluation being like the very first thing and, and being yeah. measured in like weeks <clears throat> or a month or so, not measured in long term. Okay, so did 
did that resolve your, are we still confused? And I mean us, are we confused? I think we are. However, I just want to clarify that the commission section, when we were talking about how adding in some site specific decision or suggestions, I want to make sure that we're not holding back progress on this side, that they're not going to be waiting for a green light from the commission over here. I just wanted to make sure that all of this is I, working together. Y yes, ma'am. And there's nothing in this commission that gives it authority. It, they, they come up with a recommendation and they come up with um, proposed legislation. They, they don't, they, they're not exercising a go, no go decision at any point. Okay. I just wanted to make sure that we weren't putting one ahead of the other in terms of what they were looking at. But if you're all assuring me that's not the case, then I will put my faith in all of you. Yeah, no, 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 no. Continue to think about what you're thinking. And, and, and it'll help, I think, to see uh, a clean copy of the Walner agree. Uh, I agree. A, yeah. a fresh copy would be. Yeah, yeah. But, but don't, don't let go of that. I mean, if, if, if you think we may have missed something, let's not. Go ahead. We might not want to refer to Site Selection Commission. Not as a, I'm not calling that the title. Okay. I'm, I'm saying there's a, there shall be a commission and we said that shall be responsible for community coordination to include aspects right. okay. like law enforcement. Okay. You know. Just I wouldn't give them any no. idea that they're selecting anything. No, that no. Okay. I I I I think I agree with you, and that's why I, I reread it and um, while we were going, and I'm I'm happy that there is no authority beyond writing a report and proposing legislation. I also want to say that Walner. Um, amendment here looks very different than Walner's original amendment. So I think there's, uh, it should be coming from this division and not Walner. Thank you. I'll, I'll happily call it the division three amendment uh, after we look at it and we all are okay. Mr. Chair, I just want to clarify yeah. that that clarification on, in your agreement that we're not putting that site decision into the commission that resolves my confusion. Okay. Good, good. Um, I would like to, because I don't think we're quite done yet. We're very, very close. Uh, I would like to close the conversation on the proposed Division Three amendment to HB 49. I'm going to say again, it's going to get replicated in a way in which it can be the amendment to SB 1, if that's what we want to do tomorrow. Um, but Mr. Ribson has been teed up a couple of times to come talk to us about his numbers for what he thinks operations may look like, costs. It's, it's, it's not relevant to today's work session in terms of producing an amendment. It's irrelevant because I'd like to lock down the amendment scope that we've already done. But, but I do want to make sure that Mr. Ripson can give us some numbers I think I think this is the first public review of these numbers. Is that true, Mr. Ripson? Yes, that's right. All right. Yeah. So this really just—I mean, just very simple. Just kind of showing, right? The biggest cost at SYSC is the is the personnel costs, and as as we explained earlier today, um, you know, a lot of those personnel costs are uh, increased based on the fact that it essentially operates on an island, um, and that we no longer can enjoy the economies of scale that maybe were once envisioned if you had 144 youth and now you only have, you know, 5, 12, 18. Um, <coughs> pardon me. Um, so the idea is, this is just kind of showing what the anticipated personnel shifts would be in a shared services model. Um, and there's a couple changes here, right? So just to show what these lines are, and there would be other potential savings, sorry, I'm jumping ahead there, but um, you know, there are costs that go to maintaining the rest of that campus, right? There's a lot of grass that needs to be mowed. There's a lot of old buildings that we try to patch together as best that we can and keep from becoming dangerous um, hazards. It's probably the best that we can do with them at this point. Um, 
Uh, so there's a lot of cost that goes into there. There's also a lot of cost that just goes into utilities of heating and cooling that massive building to the tune of about $800,000 a year, right? So certainly a much smaller facility would have smaller costs and you'd lose all those other costs associated with the campus. I haven't projected those in here because I, I don't know what the next place is, right? But there would be certainly costs within there that are also all general fund appropriations at this point. But looking at really what is the bulk of the cost with the facility staffing, we do anticipate... Um, some significant savings really to the tune of, like I said before, close to, uh, you know, 2 million and change in terms of uh, staffing costs. And that really is through being able to reduce some of the um, some of the positions and either sharing them with a future facility or subcontracting some of that out with a future facility. That would depend on whether you are co-locating with Hampstead or New Hampshire Hospital. Right, Hampstead is operated differently than New Hampshire Hospital in that most of the services within Hampstead are done by contracted um, by a contracted entity, whereas kind of the administrative oversight is by DHHS and the administrators are DHHS. The the staff are primarily contracted. New Hampshire Hospital is more of a mix, where you have a lot of state staff, but you also have a mix of contracted staff with Dartmouth. Um, SYSC today is more of a mix where we have mostly state staff, but we do have some contracted staff with Dartmouth, like our psychologist, our part-time psychiatrist, and our clinicians, um, and recently our educators as well. Um, so what you see here really is just kind of the shift in reducing some of those positions that we would no longer need if we were in a shared services model. And then you add in at the bottom a couple of new contracts to replace some of those services on the model to the right. So where you see grants for public assistance, that's actually the education contract. I don't know why it's called that. That's in our budget, the line that it would have showed up in. I don't really understand those things, but that would have been the, that's the education contract. And where it says contracts for program services, that would be the contract for, um, Things like uh, like cleaning, food, and things like that. If this was to be say at at Hampstead, where we were contracting those services out as a subcontract um, through their larger contract to to maintain that facility. So, um, with that, so I'm I'm going to take the 64 number on the on the right as yep. as notional. This is not this is not obviously not a final version of what you guys would propose. Correct. Um, and and so I. I can't help myself, but when you, you've listed a switchboard operator, you get two comments. We, we don't do switchboards anymore. It's a... <laughs> and, and also, if there is something that could be shared uh, with another facility, you know, having somebody operate the reception of the phone would be yeah. a candidate. So the switchboard operator, like those are just still the names that our classification system uses for, no, I get it. for administrative support staff. 1950s, right? so, it was a great decade. So, and I believe there's currently an effort underway to try to change all these by the end of this fiscal year, or at least change some of these by the end of this fiscal yeah. year. So that might look different, but but yeah, what that really is, is that's the administrative, that's kind of the administrative support team. Okay. All right. So again, again, the point is let's let's look at sharing as much as we can. And all right, thanks. Do questions, Representative Weiler? Uh, you leave out the teachers in the second column. Are we going to be um, remote learning? No. What this anticipates. So again, that that thing that says grants for public assistance three hundred thousand dollars that anticipates that we contract that out, which um, actually we've already started doing. Um, our educators have retired, all of them. And uh, we entered into a contract just recently with an entity called My Turn, which does at-risk youth education in Manchester, Nashua, and Franklin. Um, and that I'm really excited about because, you know, those are also communities where a lot of our kids come from. So it'll be a nice connection between what they have in their community, what they can get at SYSC, and hopefully facilitate better communication and planning between the two. Um, operations and you have several grades you have to teach in several subjects it's difficult. it's it's very complex and what my turn has done in their other programs which we're excited about is they really they already operate in a model that really is more of like an individualized learning model instead of a classroom based model right and that was kind of one of the challenges with with our our state-run model was Right. The teachers, the educators there really were used to running a classroom based model for decades, right? Because that's what the facility always had. 
And as um, the census changed and the populations dropped and really any given day, we have kids from all different age ranges and all different learning needs that we need to be able to individualize, um, you know, their education for. And we would accommodate that by having a teacher work with the youth on, you know, the various topics. And we had some, some virtual platforms that they could use to supplement something called Plato, uh, like Plato and Socrates, not like the stuff you play with. Um, and, uh, and the VLAC system, which would kind of allow some additional expertise to let the youth work one-on-one -on -one to learn what it is they need to learn to go back and get credit when they return to their home schools. Um, so we, we've been supplementing that stuff, but it really wasn't the, it wasn't kind of the, the format and skill set that the historical staff were really comfortable with. Um, so I am excited that with this new model, we're going to, we're going to be in a good, a good spot, but it was all just, just, just brand new, like literally this month, brand new. Do we need that many nurses or is it just to make sure you have 24 hour coverage? So what this anticipates is fewer nurses than, than the last. It still anticipates that we want nurses during the, during the awake hours, but that for overnights, we would no longer have an on staff nurse. Um, currently we do keep an on staff nurse overnights in the case of an emergency or in case of a late night admission, sometimes something will happen in the middle of the night and a kid shows up and we have to do one of the requirements under federal and state laws to do a physical assessment of every kid upon admission. Um, in conversations with leadership at the facilities that we'd be able to co-locate with both thought that, you know, given how unusual those circumstances are, that that's a responsibility that a staff within those other facilities could step in on those unusual circumstances to be able to cover for us so we wouldn't have to pay somebody to, you know, to basically just sit there just in case. Um, and then, yes, of course, you'll notice the, um, a lot of the, the maintenance, laundry, those types of things are not included on the shared service model, um, right? We have plenty of need for those folks. There's other places in the department that can absorb them, whether that's at Hampstead or, um, or New Hampshire Hospital or somewhere else, but they'd be able to be part of kind of that larger system and not, not um, you know, running a separate small facility for SYSC. And <coughs> uh, there was one other group here that I'm not remembering right now. Mm, slipped my mind. Oh, the kitchen staff, of course, which we already talked about. So, so I would just uh, add to this that um, I don't know that it's time sensitive, but since we just set up the architect to do 6 to 12 and 12 to 18, you might need to be thinking the same thing about your operational staffing. Would, would, it, would there be any difference? I assume there would be a tiny difference. Um, it, it, would be, it would be relatively small difference. Yeah. Um, right when even right now when we're working with 12 kids or 18 right. kids it right. really is a relatively small difference because it's right. really about how many units I, you have to run to keep I, kids safe I, I don't expect it to be a big yeah. number but I, I just do want us to think through yeah. what that number is and so. I and I'll, I'll just address right up front I'm sure some folks look at that 45 youth counselor number and say why do you need that many for this few kids and I will say you know the lesson over the last year is that we still need a large pool of frontline milieu staff. We might think differently about how we manage those folks. And it's one of the things that might come out in those conversations with this committee that you're talking about, the safety committee. Um, we've been looking at models that other states use. You know, do you think about shifting that role? Right now, our frontline youth counselors, our, our milieu staff, they're really both responsible for the primary security role and the primary kind of interaction treatment de-escalation role. And it might be worth thinking about, you know, do you kind of separate some of those functions out and have a, a smaller team of folks who are more focused on security and let your other staff be really, really heavily focused on your kind of treatment de-escalation? I still think it would be the same number overall, but it would be kind of a different categorization of how you utilize your your workforce. All right, Representative Walner. I just I just wondered, you, you did just say that you had had some preliminary discussions with a couple of the locations with not not with the town folks with the with the administration with, of the facilities with the facilities yeah so would you have some sort of interagency agreement that you would have to yeah. pay i mean you're going to obviously have to pay for food yep yeah it would have depending on which site it would differ right if it was new hampshire hospital it would really probably be kind of more through the budget process and how we structure the budget between the two facilities if it was hampstead where a lot of those functions are already done under contract it would have to be kind of through a contract amendment with the entity that does a lot of that work oh. but either way yeah there'd have to be a formal structure for that 
Uh, Representative Mooney. Oh, you were pointing over here, Representative Irv. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Can you just tell us why the Sununu grounds is still even in the running as a site selection, given your presentation? As I said, there's significant disadvantages to that to that site. That being said, until we've actually determined that there is an adequate piece of land, parcel of land on the other sites, you know, it's hard to eliminate that site as a possibility. Um, and that, you know, site selection work hasn't yet been completed to be sure that we have an appropriate physical plant site um, for New Hampshire Hospital co-location or Hampstead co-location. But I think, you know, the current, the current site is, you know, comes with historical and operational challenges. May I follow up? So there's quite a cost to making that determination. I'm just, you know, we've, we've been talking about this for years. I'm just wondering why that little piece of the puzzle wouldn't have already been answered. Well, that's, again, that's work that was, that the intent was that you would build that into the contract with the, with the design firm, right? And we've never been authorized to go forward to do that work. So that was the, that was kind of always the plan and the intent of how this was going to move forward. I suppose there could have been another way to approach that, but, um, and again, I'd also point to right last year, we went through this whole process and nobody seemed to be, you know, so concerned about the site location. So that was just kind of a normal, well, it, it didn't come up at the committee of conference. And I don't remember that being even a, a much of a conversation, even in division three to my memory. It was a hot topic when we were talking about the secure forensic hospital and Concord sensitivities to having things jammed on them. But, but. You're right. I think you're right. Are, th are, are there any other questions? So, so, so at this point, Mr. Ripple, you're the most important man in the room. So, so, so I just want to hear you summarize what you think you're going to be doing and, and then, and then we'll close out from there. Sure. Um, so we'll start with the beginning, starting with Amendment 311H as a, as a starting point. Uh, the first section, rather than revising the dates, will repeal Section 329 of House Bill 2. That was the part that uh, closed the Sununu Center effective March 1st of this year. Section 2 of that amendment, the $2 million appropriation for design options will remain in with some additional language stating the department shall consider two design options, one for a 6 to 12 bed facility and one for a 12 to 18 bed facility. There will be a date of September 30th in there for the site evaluation option, but not for the uh, two design options. You will keep in the section from the bill as introduced that appropriates uh, $1.5 million for operating costs for the rest of this fiscal year. From Senate Bill 2, Senate Bill 1, sorry. <laughs> you will keep in part of the paragraph that's on page 2, lines 3 through 9, but you'll remove the provision about completion of the project on or before November 1st, 2024. Also from Senate Bill 1, you will keep Section 6 uh, with various modifications. One is, in addition to the commission will be uh, renamed rather than a public safety commission, it will assess the community impacts uh, which will include public safety, fire safety, and other related factors. Uh, it will also consider site location. Down on lines 16 through 19, we'll make sure that it contains representatives from lo local law enforcement agencies and representatives from municipal governing bodies. Down on lines 31 through 34, I'm not sure that anything needs to change there, although I do have a note about site selection, so maybe that should specify that the preliminary report will include a recommendation as for site selection. 
And I don't think anything else about that needs to change. So that's what I have. Okay, and, and just double check the repeal dates that, that are on page six, just to make sure we didn't, we sure. don't just miss something administratively. Sure. All right, I I think that's a good summary. Did, did he miss anything that anyone pick up on? Okay, I think that's good. Um, Ms. Ripson, thank you so much for your patience. Uh, the child advocate is here. Do you have any words of wisdom for us? Are we doing okay? Thank you. Um, I would just like to share the importance in considering therapeutic components at the current facility while the other facility is being built. I know that was included in Senate Bill 1 and was a very important aspect for the care of the children that are already there. We want to ensure that they're receiving the appropriate treatment so that they do not return to the facility. Any questions? I, I think we heard you. Um, and uh, we are not done. We're going to continue through the HB2 process, uh, and, and then this commission obviously is still alive. So, All right, uh, anyone else? Uh, the, our, our, our friend in the very back with the mask, did you have anything to say to us? Oh, okay, all right. Well, I'd say with that, Division Three work session is adjourned. Well, until the next one, which is tomorrow, right after the full finance. But that's a separate, distinct work session. So, all right. So this work session, I think, is done. I think. Yeah, okay. <clears throat>